joining forces when times get tough. Partnerships, collaborations, mergers, acquisitions. Probably the largest quarter three M&A market of all times. What this means for an industry that's booming. Raising capital is at the forefront of our agenda. Right? And one that's been buffeted by the pandemic. We continue to remind ourselves to take a more aggressive approach to find new opportunities. They need to acquire critical assets. Is this a way to manage growing pains and come out stronger? This is not the best place to fall ill. Pototan is a rural town in the western Visayas in the Philippines. The nearest medical facility is hours away by car. Angelu Estrella has brought health products and services to communities like this for three years. The mode of transportation here of the people is actually this one, the motorcycle or the tricycle. She works for Reach 52, a startup which aims to bring healthcare to the underserved. But that all changed when the pandemic hit. The, the impact of COVID has, of course, been huge on our organisation. Is in terms of delivering our core services in the rural areas, never been harder. Right, lockdowns overnight, we can't move efficiently. Um, just the whole quarantine uh, issues that we face severely hampered our, our activities in the field. In addition to restrictions, funding dried up. The team in Singapore headquarters had to decide what to do. Raising capital is at the forefront of our agenda. It's coming into 2020, we had a number of funders very interested in us. The pandemic hits and you know all bets are off, paralysed by you know, pandemic and fear and just not wanting to do deals or investments. The pandemic has made healthcare the biggest global concern. Globally, the healthcare market is worth two trillion US dollars. Yet half the world's population do not have access to healthcare. With the pandemic, isolated communities become more isolated. So while Reach 52 couldn't expand their services on the ground, expanding their digital health services became urgent. Adapt quickly to expand both existing and new digital health services to support with COVID-19 itself, but also to continue to deliver our essential services in these areas for a range of other health conditions. Route 52 is entirely based upon the fact that the public sector cannot do this alone. We've had strong traction with partners over the years, which has been fantastic, and that's been everybody from, yeah, large pharmaceutical companies to large insurers through to, you know, large tech, tech organisations. Okay. Through Reach 52, pharmaceutical companies can access large rural populations. Reach 52's offline apps allow residents to buy medicine, insurance policies, and other health products from a marketplace. So the value that we're adding in the community um, is actually less hassle, less cost, and the travel less time, you know, time consuming going to the town proper. Before the pandemic, Reach 52's partnership model worked so well that two years after entering the Philippines, they expanded to Cambodia and last year, India. They were looking at Africa when the pandemic put the brakes on the aggressive expansion. But Reach 52 decided to continue with a partnership strategy that was already working for them. Working with Facebook, they built and launched a COVID-19 information and symptom checker chatbot 
to curb misinformation about the virus. In the first week of the chatbot's launch, over 6,500 people used it. It has since been rolled out to 10 other countries. We also used our, used our data we, with the public health providers so we could identify uh, the most high risk, most vulnerable people in the communities and provide into very targeted interventions, really expanding into digital first new services to reach the communities during that challenging period. The second challenge was to upskill frontline community health workers for COVID-19. An education app provides resources and tools. Compared before the pandemic and now during the pandemic, people are actually availing more of our services um, in our marketplace, both the medicines and the insurance, because uh, people are now getting the, the value of, of health. Since the pandemic, REACH 52 expanded operations from 100 to 400 communities and Angelou's projects have increased by six times. This is, yeah, fully digital, Facebook-led support. We've since scaled those chatbots as well. We started with COVID for the pandemic. We're now doing them for healthy eating, for maternal and child health, with a number of other partnerships. Great platform to reach users through a channel that they're familiar with. Bigger players are looking at buying up startups because they know that for them to be digitally capable, they need to acquire critical assets. But what if we can actually create ecosystems where multi-parties can cooperate and use each other's platforms to be able to get ahead? Tough times may give businesses an opportunity to grow. But what can you do when your business is tourism? Travel Unicorn Clock has been on the growth trajectory since they launched six years ago. When the pandemic hit, their revenue plummeted by 90%. They had to let go 20% of their staff and their founders have not paid themselves for months. The first thing they did was reorganize the company to become more flexible. We basically shifted you know, our entire quarterly strategy planning sessions into a much faster iteration mode uh, whereby we sit down as a senior team on a weekly basis. At the early you know, stage of the pandemic, we took more defensive action, meaning optimize costs, right? And continue, but at the same time, we continue to remind ourselves to take a more aggressive approach to find new opportunities. Responding to global lockdowns, they came up with a slew of home-based activities and launched Crook Home in 14 markets. They did this by partnering merchants to co-create experiences like do-it-yourself kits. They complemented the kits with blogs, online workshops and free virtual tours also took off. Bubbles within Asia will start to form very, very soon, um, but people are still very interested about you know, culture in Europe. And that's where we work with our partners there to bring those through virtual experiences to make sure that people are still keeping up to date of about what's happening there. The strategy paid off with over 2,000 bookings in Singapore within two months of the launch. But the revenue earned was nothing compared to pre-pandemic times. They had to do more. Aligning ourselves closely with governmental industry stakeholders is, is very important, that's number one. Number two, we are in constant communication with our merchant partners. By partnering tourism boards in Asia, Kluk could take advantage of tourism campaigns. Kluk's wide reach also meant the tourism boards could design targeted messages to stimulate domestic travel. In Taiwan, Kluk helped traditional businesses migrate onto the digital platform. They also collaborated with Starlux Airlines to offer a flight to nowhere that sold out within minutes. But each market is different. Different pandemic requirements, different customer wants and needs. There is a category where we really have no fundamental analysis. We call this the unknown category. 
travel falls in that category. There is a bunch of small tactical things that companies are trying to do to keep themselves afloat, uh, not just being able to raise capital, but actually they're coming up with different ideas. How to grow new opportunities and how to move forward. Making partnerships and collaborations pay off. A health tech startup is expanding into new markets and services at a time when healthcare is the top priority worldwide. A travel and leisure activities booking platform is growing their service offerings despite the dramatic impact on global travel. Both businesses have advanced because of partnerships. Now, I just want to give you one critical data point. This is important to note. After the last global financial crisis in 2009, in the first three years, companies that transacted, i.e. either acquired or divested, had an advantage of about 25 percentage points over the companies that did not over a 10-year horizon. So the advantage of transacting is super important when you come out of a situation like this. This time around, I'm urging companies to do two things, transact and transform. The transaction they need to either divest or acquire, but the transform is a critical agenda around enabling digital in their core operating businesses. It's actually fundamentally changing their business model up and down the stack to be digitally enabled. 2020 for Reach 52 was meant to be about scalability into new regions, but they found themselves adapting. They piloted other health services, and they did this by partnering with the private sector and community. In rural Pototan, Anjulu leads the way to pilot a free teledoc service. It follows a triage method where inquiries are made through Facebook Messenger or a call. She assesses them before contacting a doctor. She gets about 10 calls per day. Height, weight, um, blood pressure, if they have, um, the consult reason, um, travel history, just to make sure, then um, I, would, I would then have an Excel file of it shared to our doctor on board so that she can actually see it. So I think any health, health tech company that provides data, helps, uh, helps patients without having to go to the hospital uh, is going to be a very interesting period for them. And I expect there to be a boom in that space. Another service Reach 52 piloted was ultrasound screening for expectant mothers. They were able to do this through a partnership with Philips, which provided a portable ultrasound device. One midwife in Pototan was trained to conduct the ultrasound service, which would later be offered on the marketplace service. So it's really bringing together um, the private sector innovation, uh, the public health workers and community health workers along with our teams and our technology on the ground to deliver an affordable and accessible maternal health service for these communities. Six months into the pandemic and Kluk has expanded their range of services to launch Kluk Live, an interactive mobile live stream feature and with it, a form of travel-tainment with interactive instant video content. Roseanne Poir leads the team with live streams. Her job has taken a 360-degree turn since expanding into this new service. She used to manage Kluke's offline events, the largest of which was the travel fair last year that saw 35,000 attendees. Things are really heavy logistically. Uh, we have to, you know, uh, come up with the ideation, the concept months ahead of time. If you're talking about like my live stream now, things happen in a matter of like one to two weeks or even a matter of days. Cloak has explored seasonal hyper-localised content in their live stream events, from Mooncake Festival to staycations. They get an average of 15,000 views and heightened conversion rates. A Thailand staycation deal sold out in eight minutes. So how does Kluk know what their customers want 
and plan accordingly. We very quickly configured our teams into what we call domestic task forces. We are able to have the biggest pulse on ground. We are able to pick up on what people want and then partner with the local partners a lot more closely. Kluge operates with a lean team that multitasks. They're the ones like writing our blog articles, they're managing our social media, they're the ones liaising with merchants, right? They are even setting up the live streams and hosting them. Having an awesome team on execution is much more critical than to some extent having an awesome team on planning. The beauty of a tech platform is you can run thousands of experiments at the same time to go through that fast measure and learn iteration. Scenario planning is probably critical for the travel industry. We've noticed that the worst case scenarios that they were looking at was probably not bad enough. So we've essentially stretched them to think about worse than worst case scenarios. And that has allowed them to raise more money earlier rather than later. Okay. Now, it's time to take stock and look to the future. But what do these companies need to consider? If you wait any longer, uh, others will move forward, you might be left behind. Reach 52 piloted two healthcare services during the pandemic. But at a time with so much uncertainty, should businesses be careful about expansion? We had an incredibly, incredibly bad second quarter. Um, the third and fourth quarter have really, really picked up. And, and what's been really great to see is uh, Singapore businesses being probably our top clients. Um, we used to make a lot of our funding in America, in, in Europe. Um, but our biggest projects at the moment are all with Singapore-based headquarters and certainly, um, yeah, having enough capital to pay our bills is right at the top of the agenda, but just given our performance and traction at the moment, we're really safe into sort of late next year when we'll plan to scale this up properly. Despite their pandemic-induced setbacks, Reach 52 managed to accelerate the launch of a new diabetes and hypertension program. Collaborating with the Pototan Municipal Health Officer and Reach 52's Teledoc service, screening began in September. One of the big problems is often around uh, not necessarily just the, the poor access to medicines, but also the lack of diagnostics. So people don't even know that they've got these symptoms and can't get tested. Partnerships with NGOs, community-based teams, and the use of digital health solutions are paving the way for future partnerships. You can use the data to really pinpoint the needs of that population. If we know there's a high risk of diabetes in a particular area, you can focus the diabetes education and awareness programs, either through digital channels or through uh, outreach programs. You can work with partners to provide more community-based testing and screening for those conditions. We are continuing to hire, we're continuing to grow our client list, so perhaps we can't visit the communities, we can't fly. It doesn't change the mission and in fact it actually means we have to work faster, so I don't see any major change in the next two years. The Singapore Rediscovers campaign is led by STB, Enterprise Singapore and Sentosa Development Corporation. As part of the campaign, Kluk has teamed up with STB and it's creating new experiences based on consumer trends. The ability to look at what people are searching on our app, the ability to connect what kind of data or signals that we're picking up online, and then working with our merchants to create that experience that never existed before. Putting more offbeat sites on tour itineraries to appeal to customers already familiar with the destination. That is the challenge for Kluke and its merchants. Robin Lowe, for instance, started off with bike tours, but since the pandemic, 
he expanded to include tours to a kampong, a kelong, and more recently, tours made for locals. In the past, you know, we were so busy with bicycle tours and, you know, it, day in, day out, we were just busy with it operationally. But now, it pushes us to move into new areas. And uh, very interestingly, just, I felt that perhaps they are there to stay because my, my concept here is very simple. Um, whatever is suitable for foreigners may not be suitable for locals. But if a local would like a particular tour, the foreigners confirm will like it. <laughs> Once partners like Robin redesign their services, Kluk helps them update their listings and test interest with the local market. Roseanne and team are finding new ways to work with merchant partners testing and reviewing experiences and co-creating content for their live streams and curator tours. It's essential for us to understand the verticals that we have and the types of merchants that we have. And it's really important for us to also educate them on how you know, our platform can benefit them. Separately, Cloak is also working with STB as one of five booking partners for the $320 million Singapore Rediscovers Voucher Scheme. It's doing well locally, but what about other markets? A few new segments that we, we uh, really capitalise on and now seeing really, really strong momentum, uh, one being uh, staycation, right? A combination of hotel plus experience, uh, which really plays to our uh, forte. Uh, and then secondly is on car rental, uh, as we believe that people will be looking to, you know, obviously cannot fly, but will travel within, you know, it's the vicinity uh, and car rental will be key. And if you think about it, Asia, uh, in Asia, car rental wasn't really a big industry, but now it's really pushing it. Um, and we made uh, a quick decision to actually acquire a car rental company uh, during the early phase of the pandemic and now able to roll out these services across most of the markets in Asia. In terms of acquisition strategies, do, do deep diligence, understand how that embraces into your business, think about what it means to bring it into your business, and think about how it fundamentally will change your operating model, etc. Partnerships, collaborations, mergers, acquisitions, how some companies are managing growing pains and coming out stronger.